Morina Koto. Thank you everyone for joining us and welcome to um, the first Offshore Wind uh, Forum for New Zealand. Ina iwi ina mana in the reo tina koto, tina koto, tina koto katoa. E rauranga tinga ma e huuhu i mai nei. Ki te tautoku te kaupapa o te rā, ki he mihi nui, tina ki a koto. I'd like to ask the Bench Tanaki team to stand and join me in our opening karakia, please. Ko ranga nui e tu i honei, ko papa tu anuku e tā koto a kenei. Ara hina mai mātou, e roto i o koroa, koroa i aroha. Mō a ki tonu, tihei mauri ora. E te pōai o raro i te Taranaki maonga, ko nga mutu te kāinga, ko Gilliland te tupuna, ko Gilliland, ko Miller, ko Blacklock nga whānau, ko au te tuma whakarau, te puna umanga, ko Justin Gilliland ta ko ingoa, nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. I've just welcomed um, us all to um, this exciting day and asked for um, it to be a, a, a great day with, for our work and our mahi um, today as we think about the potential and future for offshore wind and introduce myself. Um, I am Justine Gilliland, Chief Executive of um, Tapuna Umanga or Ventures Haranaki. I also just note that um, the reason, part of the reason we're all here today is that um, in April, um, at Venture Tanaki, we put out a discussion paper about the potential um, for offshore wind in New Zealand, in Taranaki particularly. And the res interest that that paper has generated um, has been so significant that we felt that there was a real need to actually bring everybody together and join up some of the conversations because we were finding that we were kind of being in the middle of um, people wanting to talk to us about one thing and then someone else and then we thought well, we need to join those people up with those people and so the the best way to do it we felt was really to have a forum where we can all come together um, and have some of these important conversations so thank you all for taking the time um, to join us today um, I'll also just note that uh, we do actually have morning tea so um, in case you were worried that you were going to be sitting at your tables for three hours with no break um, it's okay, we do actually have morning tea. It's not noted in the program, sorry, but there will actually be a break um, for morning tea at about 10.30. Uh, also, a couple of other things to note is that um, we do have some media joining us um, from time to time today. Um, so please just be aware of that, um, I guess, if you're saying something that um, you might want to um, just keep between the, the people at your table um, or you know something that, that's commercially sensitive. Um, we also have um, a range of participants joining us via Zoom, so um, welcome to them. Um, the session's being recorded as well, and so um, there will, it'll be available to people following today as well. So for our Zoom participants as well, um, just be aware, if you, if you aren't already aware, that you may wish to switch to the gallery view um, in your screen. Um, and also please do feel free to submit Q&A through the, the Zoom functionality for that, and we will um, try and get your questions answered by the by the presenters through the day. If not, then um, we will be ensuring that all questions are answered and emailed out to everybody um, following the forum. Uh, the um, other thing obviously I just need to note is um, with regards to um, safety. So um, if there is in the event of an emergency, there will be an alarm sounded. The exits are through the, the way you came in um, and then out through the, the hotel main entrance or out through this exit here. And the assembly point is around at the front entrance of the, main, the hotel, which is sort of the, the covered atrium, the top car park area. Um, toilets, there are toilets just here that are specifically for us this morning, or there are also toilets that are out, you go out through the bar and turn left, and they're just in the, in the corridor past the orangery. In the event of an earthquake, um, obviously drop cover hold under the tables, please, and um, await further instructions from the venue staff. I'll also just note too that um, for those all important food breaks, um, our food will be served just um, to the, at the back of the room to, through, the, through the doors to the left. So those will be opened um, when it's time for, for morning tea and lunch and so on. Right, so without further ado, um, I'd like to welcome um, the Mayor of South Taranaki District, um, Phil Nixon. So Phil um, is a farmer and electrician by background. 
Um, and I should note that all of the presenters, their bios are in the program. So I'm not proposing to read out everyone's um, bio uh, before they start. But what I am going to share is a little fun fact that you might not know about each presenter. Um, and so um, for Phil, um, he is the proud father of four boys and three granddaughters. So welcome, Phil. Thank you, Justine. <clears throat> Hia ha te mia nui o te ao. Mākua ki, hi tangata, hi tangata, hi tangata. Nā mehe nui, tēnā koutou katoa. Ko Phil Nixon, kora mātoua o Taranaki ki te tonga. So I have just welcomed you all, granted you best wishes. And I have said that I believe the most important thing to us in the world is the people, the people, the people. And that is why we do all these things. It is all around us and our sustainability into the future. It is my pleasure to give you an introduction to Taranaki and an overview of our regional vision and strategy. Sorry. This is centered on having a just transition into a low emissions economy. The world is committed to taking action to lower greenhouse gas emissions. Taranaki is seeking to lead the way in New Zealand, particularly as we have a reasonably high regional emissions per GDP. We also want to ensure that this transition is just. The past shows that large challenges like this can lead to a legacy of negative impacts for some. With early planning and leadership, we are looking to avoid this. In August 2019, Taranaki launched a co-designed roadmap for how the region will transition into a low emissions economy by 2050. The key to all this work, the key of this is all working together focused around the seven PO, co-creation with communities, iwi, local and central government, businesses, educators, unions, and workers. This was the cornerstone of the approach. The co-creation was a significant undertaking with over 70,000 engagements right around our monga. Launched, this launched Taranaki's roadmap to 2050 in August 2019. This included workshops, surveys, and creative challenge to engage with our tamariki, our young people of our region. Our 2050 vision and roadmap is captured in a picture. The bottom left shows where we are today with people, our re people of our region standing at the foot of the monga and viewing pathways into 2050. The pathways represent the topics that were determined important to our region as we transition into a low emissions economy. Our vision section depicts key outcomes resulting from activities in our pathways. We'll have a vibrant region with diversification to net zero emissions in our vision. And on the emerging pathways, you'll see this is supported by a diversified energy portfolio contributing to low emissions. Our vision also boasts zero waste commercial buildings, low emissions transport, flourishing flora and fauna, resilient and sustainable housing and communities, along with bustling rural communities and diversified regenerative land use. To expand on the main themes of our 2050 vision, a strong, sustainable environment, education options that move and flex with a changing world, education needs to be agile and keep up with the challenges around us and ensure our young people are well equipped for theirs and our futures. These young people are our future. Attractive jobs, 
We do have a broad range of options and a flow of emerging opportunity. A similar lifestyle to the one we enjoy now, shared by all for the benefit of all. Leading the way in a sustainable, low emission energy and a region that looks out for and cares for its self and its people. Taranaki like no other. As you've seen in an earlier picture, our energy transition is particularly important. We've developed an energy transition pathway action plan and detail how we'll do to do this, how we're to do this. Many of those actions are progressing. Araaki, a national new energy development centre, was launched in July this year and is based in Taranaki. Government support of 27 million toward the development of this centre was announced by the Prime Minister at the Just Transitions uh, Summit here in Taranaki in, in New Plymouth in uh, May 2019. Taranaki is becoming the centre of hydrogen development. A green hydrogen project in Kapuni is, is being well uh, looked into at this stage where our significant wind generation capacity will supply electricity to an ammonia urea plant, produce green hydrogen that can be used as a feedstock and a zero's, zero emissions transport fuel. The development of hydrogen production and refueling network across New Zealand focused primarily on the heavy vehicle industry. Offshore wind potential, which we're going to hear a lot about today, energy ecosystem transition, partnerships, knowledge. Using our strong energy networks in Taranaki and Araaki to grow and develop the sector. Ambition to be energy and engineering center for vocational excellence. As the energy in industry changes, new skills and expertise will be needed. Our workers will need to be supported into transition. We want Taranaki to be at the center of that skill development. Our transition will seek to build on the extensive skills we already have. Some of our skills are pictured here. Armatech Environmental, it's a New Zealand leader in the design and manufacture of world-class fiberglass products and systems for odour, pollution and corrosion control. Precision Microcircuits, the only New Zealand manufacturer of thick film microcircuits. And Global Stainless, a world leader in the fabrication of stainless steel balls, fares, sculptures custom built to the specification of professional sculptors and artisans from around the globe. We will expand on our extensive capabilities in the engineering and industrial technology fields, grown from the development of the oil and gas and dairy industries. Since the 2018 sudden ban on new offshore exploration permits was announced by the government, we have unfortunately lost some of this oil and gas engineering school base through a period of uncertainty. Preparing for new energy opportunities in hydrogen, offshore wind and advanced manufacturing. A strong collaborative approach that provides leadership and direction and promote and encourage not only new opportunities, but also new careers, careers that don't even exist today. We can't do any of this transition without our people. As I said before, it's about our people. Providing a future focused workforce by industry working collaboratively with the education sector to ensure training is relevant and needs to be ready to react. Transformation and investment in wit at the core of our transition. The need for this growth has been confirmed with the announcement this week that WIT, the Western Institute of Technology for Taranaki, has almost doubled its enrolments compared to this time last year. 
714 enrollments for semester one next year compared to 371 at the same time last year, a jump of 92%. Ambition to be the energy and engineering center for vocational excellence and no reason that we cannot achieve this. No rewa, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Thanks very much, Phil. And that was a, um, a very nice um, segue for me to um, open session one uh, of our uh, forum today, but also particularly to acknowledge our sponsors. Um, so, Ara Ake, um, are one of our sponsors um, and have actually been heavily involved in helping us um, put together this offshore forum. Um, and Cristiano will be um, talking to you later in the day. Uh, and also to thank WIT, um, the Western Institute of um, Technology at Taranaki, um, as Phil mentioned, a very important institute in our region and um, one that um, is very keen to ensure that it is supporting the engineering and energy future for our region. So thank you very much to our sponsors. Um, without, without them, we wouldn't have been able to, to put on today. Uh, I just also a quick note in terms of this next session, um, we will break for morning tea partway through it. And I also just need to note that um, unfortunately due to the lovely spring weather that we're having in Taranaki at the moment, um, Dave Smith from Transpower, um, his flight was um, cancelled and he's just in the car driving up. I think, oh no, you're here, you've made it, excellent. Great, I don't have to rejig our whole program. Fantastic, sorry, thanks Dave. Thank you for, for driving up. Um, right, we'll just ignore that. Um, and so, um, yeah, well, to kick off our session, um, I'd like to welcome Bryony Bennett um, from Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment. So Bryony's a Senior Policy Advisor at MB, um, and she's going to be talking about the regulatory and market landscape for us. Um, and just a little fun fact about Bryony um, is that she's fluent in French after living in Paris for five years uh, while doing her master's. So welcome Bryony, she's joining us via Zoom. Sorry, I should note, um, she's got a presentation that is video recorded, then she'll be joining us by Zoom to go through um, a few more slides and then she's available for Q&A. So, so think about if you've got any questions for Bryony, do jot those down and we'll ask her at the end. So welcome to Bryony. Enamana, enareo, ero rangatirama, tenakoto kato, ete manafenoa, na iwi o taranaki, tenakwe, tenatato kato, koatoroa tokuturanga waiwai, ke te whanganui atara, aho e nahu ana, ke hikina whakututuki, aho e mahi ana, ko Bryony, aho, norera, Tanatato Kato. My name is Bryony Benner. I work at Hikina Fakatutuki, the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment, or MB for short. I call Aotearoa New Zealand home, and I live and work in Te Whanganui Atara, Wellington. I work for our energy markets policy team at the Ministry, providing advice to the Honourable Dr Megan Woods, Minister of Energy and Resources, who you'll also hear from later. I'm here virtually to provide some background and considerations on the policy, regulatory and market landscape for offshore wind in Aotearoa from the government's perspective. We've also sought the views of New Zealanders on this matter. Late last year, on 19 December 2019, MB released the discussion document Accelerating Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency. We received 2,600 submissions on the discussion document including 170 substantive submissions from across the energy industry. These are now published on MB's Have Your Say website. This discussion paper examined a range of issues and sought feedback on a range of policy options to accelerate the use and supply of renewable energy and energy efficiency technologies to help with achieving Aotearoa's climate goals. We have a shared and legislated target to reach net zero emissions by 2050 in Aotearoa. The government also has an aspirational goal to be supplied by 100% renewable electricity, now by 2030. One of the options we examined in the discussion document 
was whether to investigate the regulatory and economic requirements to develop offshore wind assets in New Zealand. We noted in the discussion document that the regional offshore wind market is starting to emerge. Some of you here today are responsible for gaining an exploration license to advance the Australia-based Star of the South project. Offshore wind installations have the potential to provide significant new renewable electricity generation capacity to the New Zealand energy market in the future. Offshore wind is attractive as it locates significant electricity generation capacity in one place, potentially close to large demand centers. Also, being at sea, offshore wind is less visible and less audible key objections raised with regards to onshore wind farms in some New Zealand communities. A 2019 study of New Zealand's offshore wind resource identified at least seven gigawatts of potential capacity from fixed foundation wind turbines in South Taranaki alone, with the potential for additional capacity from floating turbines and in other locations. This research was conducted by the University of Canterbury and I understand some of the experts and authors behind the study will also speak to you all today. Further, recent analysis by the International Energy Agency also suggests there may be suitable sites near shore and in shallow waters near Golden Bay in the Canterbury Bight off the coast near Bluff in both North and South Taranaki waters, as well as in the Hauraki Gulf and near Poverty Bay. So if there is sufficient demand for this resource to be developed, it could be possible for offshore wind to make a contribution to New Zealand's future energy mix. So let's first consider the cost of offshore wind technology. There's been some considerable investment at record low costs in offshore wind internationally in the past decade. And offshore wind costs continue to tumble. Yet on average around the world, the levelized cost of energy or LCOE for offshore wind is still substantially higher than that of onshore wind. We believe the current LCOE range of more favourable favorable New Zealand onshore wind sites is in the order of 60 to 70 New Zealand dollars per megawatt hour, with some of the best opportunities being even lower than this in the 55 to 60 New Zealand dollars per megawatt hour range, and well below the global average. There are even suggestions of some projects coming, coming in now at 50 New Zealand dollars per megawatt hour. The Roaring 40s 2020 Wind Generation Stack Report, prepared for MB, identified 82 possible onshore wind projects, totaling over 11 gigawatts across New Zealand that could be built between now and 2060. We also currently have around two gigawatts of onshore wind projects consented under the Resource Management Act. For offshore wind, we estimate the costs of development to be about three times greater than onshore wind in New Zealand. Now bear with me whilst we consider this. The United Kingdom's 2019 offshore wind auction closed at a strike price of around 40 pounds per megawatt hour, a record price. Due to the way these contracts for difference or CFDs work, this constitutes a subsidy for the winning project if wholesale UK electricity prices fall below £40 per megawatt hour. Auction winners pay back the difference if the sole price of electricity is higher than the strike price, and then there's no subsidy. Now, we do not hold renewable auctions in New Zealand, nor offer contracts for difference, as in the United Kingdom. But £40 per megawatt hour is lower than the current average wholesale spot price in New Zealand at today's exchange rate and lower than what we saw for average electricity prices in 2019 and 2020. So it would not necessarily need to constitute a subsidy here either. That is to say offshore wind is reaching a point where subsidies are no longer needed. That is also to say the cost of offshore wind and what it could earn back in our market at current electricity spot prices suggests that it would not not be viable to progress a bankable project here. But is this realistic? We know the realized price received for wind is often lower than average spot prices, since wind is highly correlated across New Zealand and often different wind sites are all generating concurrently. Yet we're not really talking about building offshore wind turbines here today. And offshore wind turbines may be uncorrelated from onshore wind. 
let's put this basic assessment of cost or project payback into the broader market context and what's planned for the next decade or so. New Zealand has emerged from a decade of low and steady electricity spot prices following a wave of generation investment ahead of the global financial crisis of 2008. The GFC and energy efficiency improvements slowed down electricity demand growth. This trend, this flattening of demand growth was witnessed in a number of other OECD countries following the GFC. Then in October, 2018, following a springtime period of below average inflows into the New Zealand hydro lakes, which provide 60% or more of our electricity needs generally, there was an unplanned outage at the offshore Potakura gas field production facility. This caused prolonged price spikes in the gas market as gas was scarce. This had flow on effects causing price spikes in the electricity market. Even as the production facilities were repaired and gas supplies restored, wholesale electricity prices adjusted to a new normal, closer to $100 per megawatt hour on average, above the 60 to 80 uh, dollars, New Zealand dollars per megawatt hour we've seen over the wet and dry hydro years of the last decade. Now, match, now, natural gas is only a marginal fuel in the electricity market, but helps meet evening peaks or tide us over when hydro lakes, hydro lakes are running low. There are also competing non-electricity users for gas, including Methanex, the largest consumer of gas from the Potokota gas field. Now, a hydro dependence means we sometimes still depend on gas peakers as well as coal as fuel to meet electricity demand. Developers have begun to respond to the above average spot prices in the market and the possibility of some thermal power plant retirements in coming years, or to the possibility that some gas fields such as Potokura start to decline in production levels. There's a steady pipeline of new projects in development, financing or construction stages. These are almost all renewable energy projects, by far the most competitive and low cost new generation options in New Zealand. Projects underway include Turatia Stage 1 and 2, which will then be New Zealand's largest wind farm with 60 turbines and 222 megawatts capacity under development by, Mer under development by Mercury Energy. Tilt Renewables 133 megawatt Waipipi wind farm in South Taranaki, which has just started generating, which has just started generating, and also the new potential Tohara geothermal electricity capacity by contact energy. 150 megawatts for the first stage, they progress to a final investment decision. Genesis Energy has also informed the market that it's in talks with a developer regarding power purchase agreement terms for a 300 megawatt solar farm in the Waikato. If developed, this will be almost 10 times bigger than any other New Zealand solar farm to date. However, these projects are not likely to replace the role that coal and gas still play in our electricity market. The challenge of meeting our 100% renewable electricity goal in the next 10 years is to address the dry year problem. Our hydro lakes only store six to eight weeks of energy to meet electricity demand. So when rainfall or snow melt is below average for extended periods for weeks, we rely on thermal fuels to meet electricity demand. Replacing the small but important proportion of thermal fuels that remain in our electricity mix requires new storage technologies or innovations. This is why we've seen the government investigating hydrogen fuel or pumped hydro storage projects as future storage opportunities for New Zealand. The government has already committed 20 million to establishing a nationwide network of hydrogen fueling stations. And just a few months ago, 30 million for a feasibility study looking at pumped hydro projects, such as the Lake Onslow project and other storage technologies across New Zealand. The dry year challenge will still need to be addressed before we can achieve 100% renewable electricity. So keep a close eye on this area and consider how storage might fit in with offshore wind projects. But now let's pivot. What are the other key aspects of the government's energy policy? And what are our electricity demand growth projections and long-term capacity? You'll hear a lot more on this from other speakers, but from the government's perspective, electrification of the industrial and transport sectors has been highlighted as a priority 
for reducing energy related emissions in New Zealand by independent entities, including the Interim Climate Change Committee and the Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment. Of the 40% of energy emissions in our emissions mix in New Zealand, 21% are emissions from transport, around 7% from industrial process heat, and just 4% from electricity generation. The remainder is primarily from the manufacturing and construction sector, as well as fugitive emissions. Now, Transpower, the electricity system operator, estimates electricity demand growth of 68% by 2050 if electrification of industry and transport is accelerated to meet New Zealand's ambitious emissions reduction goals for the energy sector. In contrast, in MB's 2019 electricity demand and generation scenarios, fondly called EDGES, the reference scenario suggests electricity demand grows on average at a rate of just 1.1% per year, and total electricity demand rises by just 43% by 2050. Still a lot of growth. Projected new generation capacity is 7 gigawatts by 2050 in the scenario, though so decommissioned plants will also need to be replaced. However, in the edges growth scenario with increased electrification, electricity demand is about 20% larger than the reference scenario in 2050. Uh, still not as high as the Transpower uh, projection, however. But the EDGES growth scenario published by MB projects new generation build of capacity could be still eight gigawatts by 2050 in that growth scenario. As also previously mentioned, our recent generation stack report for onshore wind published by Roaring Forties for MB identified 80 possible onshore wind projects, totaling over 11 gigawatts across New Zealand. If these were all built by 2060, that would represent a huge increase in development activity for New Zealand. The Roaring Forties report also identified three offshore sites, eight gigawatts total capacity, but it considers it likelier that the onshore projects will almost all be developed first. There's currently only 690 megawatts of onshore wind in New Zealand, which took us 20 years to develop. We have over three gigawatts of consented renewables projects that have not yet been developed in New Zealand, including around two gigawatts of onshore wind, as previously mentioned. Even in MB's growth scenario, this is likely enough new capacity to meet our electricity needs in the country by 2030. Our existing grid connected electricity generation is currently sized at just over nine gigawatts. Offshore wind projects can require a scale of a gigawatt or greater in order to be economic, given the significant infrastructure required. In some cases though, projects may be economically feasible at smaller capacities. An offshore wind farm of a gigawatt would be surplus to New Zealand's current demand for electricity or demand growth in the near term. Recall that our current installed capacity is only nine gigawatts and three gigawatts of renewables projects, including two gigawatts of onshore wind, is already consented. But a gigawatt of offshore wind could make growth in demand in the long term as we transition to a low emissions economy, as we electrify transport and process heat or replace retiring thermal power generation assets, then demand will grow. Yet there's also uncertainty to be grappled with. The exit of the TY Point aluminium smelter in the next three to five years will reduce New Zealand's overall electricity demand by 13%. This could reduce the need for new generation capacity by even about a gigawatt according to MB's edges scenarios. Offshore wind developers and investors have all this market complexity to grapple with when considering market entry. Some of you may be asking by now though, what about new sources of demand as the economy transitions to net zero? Because this could include new large industrial users such as a hydrogen electrolysis facility. The economic viability of hydrogen electrolysis is highly sensitive to electricity costs. A long-term contract price could help reduce the power price to an economic level for hydrogen production by electrolysis and provide long-term certainty regarding the input, the input of electricity as a cost. It would also provide ongoing revenue certainty for potential offshore wind farm investors. That is, a long-term contract could help underwrite development for both counterparts. 
Both hydrogen production by electrolysis and offshore wind are technologies within scope of the transition pathway for the Taranaki 2050 vision and could be investigated by Araake or the National New Energy De Development Centre in the region. And that's why we have all been brought together today. Taranaki may be an appropriate region for locating an offshore wind farm as it transitions away from fossil fuel production. We've heard suggested that petroleum platforms in the Taranaki Basin could be repurposed for offshore wind installations. We've also heard that it could be logistically challenging to convert existing petroleum platforms to platforms for electrical switchgear to support offshore wind development. It may be more efficient and safer to remove all or part of the petroleum platform and then install specially designed platforms for offshore wind developments. There's no denying there's a lot of expertise in the region though when it comes to offshore, uh, the design of offshore platforms. Additional infrastructure, including offshore substations, potentially a high voltage direct current link to the shore would also be needed. It's unclear how we would fund this enabling infrastructure. Transpower, which owns and operates the inter island HVDC and the National Electricity Transmission Grid, state owned, its revenues are regulated and capped by the Commerce Commission. It's now working through the implementation of complex changes to the National Transmission Pricing Methodology, or TPM, that allocates costs amongst transmission customers. The fair allocation of charges remains hotly debated by the industry. An offshore wind developer may need to consider independently covering the costs of an offshore transmission connection to the New Zealand coastline. There are also ongoing maintenance costs and challenges to consider due to the large scale of the installations and difficulty of access to installations at sea, often in unfavorable weather and ocean conditions. Specialist equipment, special purpose ship and expertise would also need to be mobilized from demand centers in the North Sea and Europe or other centers of offshore wind development such as those emerging in Asia or Australia. For an offshore wind market to develop in New Zealand's future, further work regarding the necessary regulatory framework of offshore wind needs to be conducted too. Developing offshore wind assets would likely require new regulations, including the possibility of introducing an allocation system for auctioning or tendering a lease for the use of the seabed, water column, and airspace above the water, and permitting for an electricity company to operate assets beyond 12 nautical miles. Any auction or tender participant would not be considered on costs alone. We've not yet considered the design of an allocation system. However, recent experience has highlighted the need for offshore players' technical and financial capability to be carefully considered before they're given license to conduct operations in New Zealand's treasured offshore environment. The social responsibility and cultural capability of prospectors will be considered too. There may be a need to extend the application of the Electricity Industry Act to New Zealand's exclusive economic zone. Offshore wind farms beyond 12 nautical miles will be subject to approval under the Exclusive Economic Zone and Continental Shelf Environmental Effects Act, or the EEZ Act. We will need to consider whether the EEZ Act adequately considers the effects of such activities on the environment and existing interests. It would be necessary to carry out environmental impact assessments and marine consent. We'd also need to consider the intersection with other marine laws such as fisheries and marine mammals protection legislation. Further, we may need to conduct geotechnical surveys to understand more about the seabed, which may include seismic surveying and engage widely with communities and stakeholders. Offshore wind generation in New Zealand's territorial waters out to 12 nautical miles would be subject to approval under the Resource Management Act. The RMA is undergoing a reform in New Zealand to make the system more navigable and find ways to balance competing priorities, but rebalance our economy in favor of zero carbon development. No developments on the scale of a large offshore wind farm have ever been developed in New Zealand waters. And we need to consider how wind generation fits within the provisions of regional coastal plans and national direction instruments under the RMA, particularly the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement. The interaction with Tiritio Waitangi, the Treaty of Waitangi, in particular Article 2, and the Marine and Coastal Area Act will also need to be assessed. Work is not currently underway to develop the regulations required, but we're closely following progress in other markets, such 
such as Australia. It is clear there are both significant opportunities and challenges ahead for offshore wind in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Whilst you're navigating the complex market and policy and regulatory landscape, perhaps keep this well-known whakatoki in mind. Whaia te iti kahurangi ki te tūhoi koe, mehe maunga tete. This means, seek the treasure that you value dearly, and if you bow your head, let it be to a mountain. Whakatoki is about perseverance and endurance, refusing to let obstacles get in your way while striving to reach goals. And a net zero future, I think, will be worth it. Um, thank, thanks, Bryony, for that um, recorded presentation. And in case you're wondering, that the reason we did that was because Bryony was potentially not originally available to be able to come join us this morning, but she is now available, so that's why she, she's able to zoom in now. Um, and I understand she has a few more slides to cover um, before an opportunity for Q and A. Um, so yeah, just thanks, Bryony, for for that, that recorded presentation. Um, obviously, helped us understand some of the complexity of this potential opportunity for New Zealand. Um, and I guess reinforce what, what we're talking about here really is it's a long term view. This isn't about the next five years, you know, that this this is a, this is going into kind of 18 years out and and beyond. Um, and as you also pointed out, it's it's not just about New Zealand's domestic energy needs. Um, it's about thinking about the potential for hydrogen domestically um, used. Um, so not just electricity and also about the potential for hydrogen export. So, um, and also thank you for those insights into the um, regulatory framework um, challenges. And this afternoon we've got, um, we'll get into further detail on that um, with other um, regulators who will be um, presenting to us around that. So um, over back over to you, Bryony, um, to cover, I understand, a few slides um, before we have some Q&A. Is that right? Kia ora, yes, good morning. Um, I'll bring up my slides. So indeed, I was meant to potentially be in a cabinet or outside a cabinet meeting this morning, but I'll go to that a little bit later. Um, I brought up some slides, I hope you can all see. Just make those a little bigger. So I just wanted to I didn't Sorry, have time. Brian, having a slight technical issue with getting your your screen up. So it was just a change from the the video recording to your to your screen. I'll wait patiently. Yeah. Let me know when you can see the slides. <laughs> Will do. Um, does look like a slight technical issue there. Um, so maybe, Bryony, um, if you are able to, I guess, perhaps talk to, to what you were going to be talking with, and in the meantime, we'll try and get the, we'll try and get the slides up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let me give it another go myself. Stop share. Okay, I understand it's okay for our online people. <laughs> it's just those of us in the room who can't see it. Okay, um, well, I'll talk you through them. The, the slides are really actually just for me to uh, clarify and make sure there are references for all of the qualitative uh, sort of numbers and analysis I provided in uh, my presentation, because I understand when it's just someone speaking, it can be a little bit difficult to follow all of the numbers. Um, and I just wanted to provide references to uh, the various resources I'd mentioned. I wasn't quite uh, tech savvy enough to sort of bring my face up and then bring uh, my slides up all by myself. We've got them now, thanks, Bryony. So cool. Yeah, I'm getting live text, so that's great. Yeah. So this that into a presentation to show, and then we'll. Um... How's that? Here we go. Great. So there's my name. If you're looking for me, um, and so this here is a, a reference to the Accelerating Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Discussion Document. For anyone who hasn't had the opportunity to read it, there's only it's about an 80-page document, or I think more than that. But there's only. Uh, a few paragraphs or about a page and a half on offshore wind, so you might want to skip to that. Um, and then, of course, you can take a look and read the various stakeholder um, submissions 
um, as well. So across the energy industry, um, the New Zealand Wind Energy Association, the like, they've all got their substantive missions up on our Have Your Say website. So you can follow this link to the MB website and take a look yourself. Um, and I know you'll hear from Ian Mason a bit later, but I wanted to just uh, point to the 2019 University of Canterbury study um, that I referred to at the beginning of my pre-recorded presentation, looking at that seven gigawatts or 7,016 megawatts um, of potential in South Taranaki that using uh, long-term wind speed data was identified. We also had this quite cool dynamic geospatial analysis that came out with the International Energy Agency last year. You can zoom in and take a look at the various sites they identified as uh, reasonable shallow waters in the New Zealand uh, continental shelf. Um, and that also has uh, the offshore wind potential all across the globe. So another good resource uh, to take a look at, which I referred to my, in my presentation. Um, and this one we're quite proud of. It had been a long time since we'd done a generation stack update at MB. Roaring 40s helped put together our wind generation stack update, which came out earlier this year. And there I referenced the LCOE range identified um, as between 60 and 70 New Zealand dollars per megawatt hour for some of the best onshore wind opportunities in New Zealand, and even lower than this in some places in between 55 and 60 um, New Zealand dollars per megawatt hour. Um, and I've even given the page references for you there so you can take a look. Um, and then there were 82 onshore projects identified in the wind generation stack with um, 11,400 megawatts uh, of total capacity. And then the offshore wind stack by Roaring 40s or the, the wind stack by Roaring 40s identified three possible offshore wind sites as well, all around the North Island um, of a total capacity of eight gigawatts um, that could be developed. Um, you can take a look on page 31, and that's also available on the MB website to take a look at. Um, I made reference to the UK's 2019 offshore wind uh, auction, um, and the price was around 40 uh, Great British pounds per megawatt hour. These are just some references from the media looking at where I got that price from. So Technica and GTM, Green Tech Media. And here, uh, I've pulled this just from the Electricity, Electricity Authority's um, info website or data website. Um, and this is the average electricity spot price at the North Island pricing node at Otahuhu in New Zealand dollars per megawatt hour. And I've used some conditional formatting just to demonstrate how we really saw electricity spot prices on average um, significantly lower over the past three years uh, uh, over the past few years prior to 2018. And a big change, you can see that $299 electricity spot price uh, monthly average in October 2018 when the Potokora uh, gas field uh, unplanned outage occurred. And that the spot price has been quite a bit higher on average throughout 2019 and 2020 as well. So what's sometimes referred to as, as the new normal. Um, and then, of course, I made brief mention of some of the uh, recent budget initiatives and funding from the government. And I've highlighted in green the 30 million for the New Zealand Battery Project, looking at pumped hydro storage projects, and the 20 million for a hydrogen refueling network. I believe you hear from Hiranga Energy a bit later today as well. But here are some of the other um, energy initiatives that have that were recently funded in the COVID response and recovery budget as well. So there's funding to uh, work on the reform of the Resource Management Act um, and direct funding as well for decarbonising industrial process heat. Also 200 million um, been announced for state sector decarbonisation and there's been some other funding as you can see uh, in Taranaki. Now, this is from uh, 2018, our emissions profile, just to give you a bit of a pie graph um, to highlight the uh, emissions mix I mentioned, which was where 40% uh, of our emissions are from the energy sector and split up between transport, electricity generation, process heat, manufacturing, construction, fugitive emissions. Um, and I mentioned as well, the MB electricity generation and demand scenarios. So I actually think uh, I made a small error in um, referring to the growth scenario, which has um, the, the reference scenario represents uh, about 
just moving my slide, about 43% growth between now and 2050 for electricity demand, and you tack on an extra 15% in our edges growth scenario. That brings us up to 58% uh, growth uh, modelled in the MB edges scenarios, uh, which is indeed a bit lower than what Transpower uh, projected under accelerated electrification in their report, Fakamani to Morihiko. I've provided links there to the MB Edges scenarios if you want to dig into it, and of course to the Transpower Fakamani Itamori Hiko report as well. Um, and these are some graphs that I've pulled out of Edges showing you the expected capacity, projected cumulative new build generation under the reference scenario. There's a table there as well uh, looking at the projected. Uh, new generation build capacity under the edges reference scenario and our growth scenario. Um, and I've also provided a graph there which shows you the difference uh, if TY is indeed phased out. I think I said in my presentation that that would be in three to five years time. I'd just like to correct that and say that the three to five years is an expected extension um, to, uh, to their phase out or to the planned exit of TY. Lastly, I made reference a few times to existing consented generation. There's a few places you can take a look at that. Of course, the uh, wind generation stack report I've referred to a few times. I've pulled this uh, annex, or this figure out of the annex, which shows you where consented and operational wind farms are. Um, and here is the list of uh, consented wind farms that Roaring Forties uh, provided a stack or expectations about which wind farms would be developed in which order. And another place that you can take a look at consented wind farms and take a look at the prospective pipeline of development is, of course, the Wind Energy Association's website. So I've provided a link there below too. Um, and you can take a look. MB Web, MB's website also shows you all of the existing current installed electricity generation capacity, which is more precisely 8.8 .8 gigawatts um, if it's electricity only and with cogeneration 9.2 gigawatts relevant legislation that I mentioned, because I, I said quite a, uh, quite a few pieces of legislation and acts which would be relevant to anyone interested in offshore wind development. So here is a short list of those relevant pieces of legislation, the Electricity Industry Act, the EEZ Act, Marine and Coastal Area Act, of course, Tetsuritio Waitangi and the Resource Management Act, which the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement sits below. So, and there is our Fakatoki again. So, happy to uh, move to some questions now. I'm going to stop sharing and bring up my face. Great. And maybe take a look either if I've seen some typed questions or. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Bryony. Um, so, yeah, we've, we've just um, I've got about five minutes or so for some questions um, from the floor or through the Zoom. Um, if I can please ask um, people here wanting to ask a question, if you can wait till we get to you with the mic just so that the people who are um, participating online can hear your question. So, yeah, do we have any questions for Bryony? <laughs> Derek. Hi, it's Eric. I'm dipping by. Bryony, you were talking about one gigawatt of um, potential offshore wind farms in a period of transition from a lower demand to a higher de demand. Did you consider in that one gigawatt power needed for export of green hydrogen. So uh, I'm not sure which scenario we're talking about, but in the say the edges demand scenarios, um, no, I don't think it does consider the potential for green hydrogen as part of that. Thank you. Oh, hi, Brian, it's Blair Walter from Oricon. Um, LCOE for offshore wind, you talked about three times capex and onshore being down as low as 50, but what's the what's MB's view on LCOE for offshore? Yeah, we can take another look at the um, offshore wind, the sorry, the wind generation stack prepared by Roaring 40s, but that estimate of it being three times higher, I believe is directly from the wind generation stack. Um, I think page 31, um, which I referred to on my slides, will have that information. But the, the three times the LCOE of onshore wind is taken from the wind generation stack. Okay. 
We've got another question over here. Hi, Brian, you're Green for Gaskell Wind Energy Association. Thank you for uh, what I thought was an excellent presentation. Uh, I guess what my question is, is, as we gather here today, it's thinking about the opportunity and the forward work program. And I was just wondering what MV's approach is to the future development of offshore wind and in terms of, you know, accelerated renewables in your work program whether you've got any uh, aspects of it set aside for further work or uh, or development, because, you know, like it's it's a big opportunity and we know that the export opportunity is is probably key to offshore wind and it's offshore wind is a key part of the Taranaki energy transition, the just, just transition. So just a few comments on um, the forward work program for, for, for MV in this area, please. Mm. Uh, I'd have to say, not at this stage. We have a number of other priorities, including the uh, electrification of process heat and decarbonisation of industry, state sector decarbonisation, reform of the Resource Management Act, um, indeed the feasibility study as part of the New Zealand Battery Project, um, and then there's work underway um, for improving energy efficiency um, and uh, or in particular, of course, I should mention that under the RMA, reforming that as a, as a whole body, there's particularly the National Policy Statement on Renewable Electricity Generation, which will be um, updated to make it easier for uh, renewable electricity generation to gain consent under the Resource Management Act. So these are sort of our key priorities at the moment within my team. Thank you. Any other questions for Bryony? Jamie. Hi. Yeah, thanks again for a great overview and insight. I guess the key messages that come out as, as challenges to address from a, a government perspective are um, the regulation right we just talked about, uh, the resource management right we just talked about, but also um, overseas, you mentioned in the UK, for instance, the government helps with that financial un underwriting and under risk with CFDs. So I guess the question is, what would you need to hear from the industry? Um, what evidence would you need to actually start influencing your program and, and changing um, the priorities of some of these things? Hmm. I think that's hard to, hard to answer because uh, I think that, I mean, it's important as government that we remain open to all opportunities and that we're not excluding any pathways and that as the costs continue to tumble worldwide, that it's more than feasible for that to start to look, for offshore wind to start to look more attractive. And we think and I think probably as we see development such as uh, even a domestic market for hydrogen fuel and seeing that as uh, as a, having export potential and seeing significant growth there might start to make something like offshore wind look like a more happy marriage for, say, um, matching with large new industrial loads. So I think it's it's something of an economic story as well. Um, and so we're watching and waiting to see what costs look like and what other players such as um, hydrogen um, production uh, investments are coming up. And of course, the government has put some uh, funding and some support around the development of the hydrogen industry. So that's uh, probably not a wholly official view, but I would say that we're, we're keeping a close watch on the costs um, and that the actions of say other players in the market may have an influence on how viable and important offshore wind starts to become in our narrative. Great, thanks, Bryony. I think we're we're about out of time for um, any further questions, unless there was a last burning one from anyone. No, enough. Nothing's come through on the on the chat. I don't think so. Um, thanks very much, Bryony. Really appreciate um, your time and um, taking us through that um, quite complex picture, which I think you know everyone in this room understands. This isn't an easy um, sort of journey that we're we're on, and we're not going to be you know done by tomorrow. So, thanks very much, Bryony. Appreciate it. All right, I'd um, now like to introduce um, Dr. Daniel Noth, um, who's a senior da data scientist at PowerCo. Um, Daniel's going to um, talk to us um, really about kind of New Zealand's future energy needs and thinking in particular, um, presenting a bit of a view from um, the business New Zealand Energy Council. 
Um, so obviously, as, as well as potentially um, anything from his substantive role at PowerCo. Um, so Daniel um, is quite um, well connected um, in terms of being part of the Young Energy Professionals New Zealand and the World Energy Council Future Energy Leaders. So we we'll really look forward to hearing from Daniel. Um, and fun fact about Daniel, um, he's got a three week old at home. So if you see him later on falling asleep, um, we won't take it personally. Yeah. Thanks, Daniel. Kia ora. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Um, yes, so my background is primarily in social science. So a lot of my understanding of energy demand, our future energy needs, really comes from uh, looking at what we do. And I'll talk about that very soon. Um, I'm involved in the Young Energy Professionals Network, which is really an organization set up to support people in the energy sector to understand some of its broader complexities, to be able to um, find out other people who are doing different types of jobs. And primarily, we're trying to find passionate people who are keen on the energy transition and help um, na them navigate their pathway through their own career and uh, help them navigate their potential skills. Uh, I've been involved in the Business Energy Council uh, mostly through this Future Energy Leaders Program, uh, which is set up by the World Energy Council. And the Young Energy Professionals Network is also supported by the Business Energy Council. The scenarios that I'm going to talk about, I'm not an expert myself in, but I have been involved in a number of the toolkits um, that these different organizations have set up over the years. So when I consider future energy needs, um, I really look at the drivers of energy demand. And for a social scientist, the drivers of energy demand really stem from the things that we have in our homes. And when we look into the future, what kinds of things do we own? What kinds of things will we own? Uh, if I look at the types of technologies that we have today, they're evolving quite rapidly from being consumers of energy to things that can store and even produce their own energy. Um, when we also look at the things that people think about when it comes to energy. So not just um, our attitudes towards energy conservation um, to carbon prices, but also very much around the, um, the things that we find important um, on our everyday life. So what things are important to us when we're looking after our families? It's really quite important when we think about wind energy as well, because is energy something that we see as it should be just set, not seen, it just should be available to us, or is energy something that can actually be a lot more part of everyday lives? Is the production of energy something that we want to hide away from us, or is it actually something we want to embrace? And I think that kind of has a big tie over to where we put um, a lot of the future production um, on our landscape. And then finally, uh, a social scientist always looks at the interaction between these things and what we actually do on an everyday um, life. Do we want to have the same lifestyles as we have today? Will they be different? Will our kind of commuting practices be exactly the same? Or are we going to get around in different ways? So thinking about our future energy needs really need to encompass these three dimensions uh, when we're looking at how we then want to um, provide um, the types of energy services or energy capacity in the future. And it's complex. On the energy sector side, there are a lot of competing issues, a lot of evolving technologies, a lot of new capabilities that are coming onto our landscape very rapidly. And these competing priorities are generally summed up by the World Energy Council is coming from our push to decarbonize, our push to um, decentralize. So that's meaning moving away from just large scale generation, but to smaller, more fit for purpose, often behind the meter generation that a lot of customers are having the ability to take part in. And then obviously digitalization, which is the ability to actually monitor, control, automate, um, predict and manage energy demand uh, rather than just be a passive consumer of it. So these two um, 
dichotomies between uh, what people want to do in the future and how we provide uh, energy uh, in the future need to be well thought of when we're considering these uh, future energy scenarios. And the two scenarios that the Business Energy Council put together um, are very um, contrasting. One really assumes that New Zealanders take decarbonisation as our key priority and that basically every decision that we make needs to have some element of decarbonisation behind that. That means rapidly changing the way we do a lot of things. It means rapidly changing the types of industries that we have, um, the, the ways that we, uh, the types of exports that we have. Um, it also means changing a lot of our everyday practices and behaviours, specifically around transport. Um, the opposite way of looking at it would be to say, well, decarbonisation is only one of our many priorities as a nation, that um, market forces can actually provide a lot of the answers and the opportunities to decarbonise in the future, and that we shouldn't uh, throw all of our um, current capabilities away now, that we should actually look at um, taking on new technologies, new efficiencies as they evolve, as they become cost competitive. And those two views, those two very different scenarios have very different implications to um, the carbon output of our energy sector in New Zealand. The Kia one obviously gives us a much faster, much more rapid decarbonisation pathway, but at a lot of um, uh, behavioural change, a lot of um, industry change quite rapidly. The TUI pathway uh, also reaches quite a large um, decarbonisation uh, level. However, it does so more slowly and it does it instead by taking new technologies as they become available and cost competitive. And it doesn't mean changing all of the things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis straight away, instead it only when they're feasible. The main reductions in carbon really come from two sectors that have been talked about already. Uh, one is from uh, transport and the other is through um, pr uh, process heat. Uh, the care scenario really says that uh, decarbonisation is, is made and uh, uh, the care scenario shows that energy reduction is really comes through changing our everyday commuting practices. A lot more uh, taking buses, a lot less private car ownership. And when private car ownership comes on board, there should be a hang of a lot more electric vehicles. They project about 3 million electric vehicles on New Zealand roads by 2050. The TUI scenario projects about 2.2 uh, electric million electric vehicles on the roads by 2050 um, and a lot less behavioral change. Uh, so you can still see a large reduction in energy use though, because they're assuming that um, as technologies evolve, uh, the energy intensity of mobility will also decrease. So that comes from more efficient engines, but also more autonomous engines that only use energy when required. And that's kind of the uh, overview of then what New Zealand's energy mix could look like in the future with these two very different views on how uh, New Zealanders might respond to some of our current energy challenges. So one important thing to note is that they, they all kind of see electricity as being a really important part of New Zealand's energy mix. Um, the main consideration really is how quickly New Zealanders evolve to having a large amount of energy in that uh, sector. Is it, is it a large amount of electricity? Is it uh, something that we want to really push really quickly or is it something we only bring in as um, the technology is actually cost competitive for other alternatives. So my talk is pretty short today because there's gonna be a lot of other considerations around some of these scenarios. But basically at a high level, it's pretty clear that New Zealand needs a lot more electricity in its system and actually pretty quickly to meet a lot of our goals, no matter which way you cut it. Um, 
one thing to we really need to be careful about considering though is not just looking at the types of energy supply that we have um, in our vast resource here in New Zealand. We need to look at what New Zealanders are actually doing and wanting uh, in the future because the, the ability to participate in the energy market is rapidly increasing. New Zealanders are investing in new technologies that mean that they can produce their own energy, store their own energy. And with the intermittency that comes from renewables, we really need to also consider technologies and solutions that enable flexibility of energy demand. So that really means the ability to move um, your primary energy use to times when it's cheaper, when uh, it's, there's less congestion on networks. Um, and that really comes down to things like the digitalization that we talked about before, um, but also energy storage. That is another really key thing uh, that will enable a lot of these things. We're also seeing in the energy market um, huge changes in skill sets in young professionals network. We're seeing a really broad um, range of capabilities of people in the energy sector. And this is only going to keep evolving quickly as New Zealand uh, transitions. So one of the things I see a lot of is the importance of understanding uh, the digitalization of energy. So not just uh, the, the physics, but how we can understand energy needs from what people say and do that we monitor through digital technologies and then how we then manage our energy system automatically so that we can get a lot of these efficiencies that come from much smarter, much more digital uh, appliances. And finally, uh, it's clear that both pathways require a large amount of leadership. One, we kind of see that you need to capture the New Zealand narrative that people will be ready to change ready to do things differently uh, in order to meet our uh, decarbonisation goals. The other one still needs a lot of uh, leadership because it's saying that we need to be okay with keeping a lot of things business as usual and being ready to adopt new technologies and practices when they are really fit for the New Zealand economy, for the New Zealand values. So thank you very much for your time. opportunity for some questions for Daniel. So if anyone's got any questions, they'd like to ask Daniel. Um, down the back there, right? Um, Hi, Daniel. Um, I'm Isabel Prosser from Prosser Communication. Um, when you're talking about emission reductions, are you looking at the whole life cycle of things that we're producing before we get to emitting? Or are you really just looking at the final product emitting? That's a good point. I think from the development of these scenarios, it's really the emitting when the energy is being consumed and used rather than the, the embedded energy of uh, any of these technologies. Any other questions for Daniel? Thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Right, we're, we're about to um, break for morning tea. Um, and so what I'd like to do is ask um, Nadia, who's our Māori Partnerships Lead at Veja Tanaki, to bless our kai. Amen. <laughs> Right. Thanks, everyone. I hope you enjoyed um, that morning tea. Just a minute to get everyone back seated. Lots of conversations going on at morning tea, so that's great. Everyone obviously having, having a good, good chat, hopefully stimulated by um, the presentations that we've had so far this morning. So the next um, session, or the remainder of session one before lunch, um, we're going to be hearing from um, Dave Smith and Andrew Ruffram. 
Um, so Dave Smith's actually going to do two presentations for us, um, so on slightly different topics, so hence why um, we've got Andrew in the middle to, to, to break that up um, and get Dave from one headspace into the, into the other headspace. Um, so yeah, it's um, my pleasure to, to introduce Dave. Um, he's Systems Planning Manager at TransPower, um, which obviously I think no, nobody in the room really needs to know, but they're the, the national grid um, owner and operator. Um, Dave manages the systems planning team at TransPower. And his first presentation, um, he's going to be talking about um, TransPower's view basically of the electricity production mix and their predictions um, for New Zealand's electricity uh, needs into the future. Um, in terms of a um, fun fact about Dave, um, a number of years ago, he was lucky enough to spend a week at Scott Base in Antarctica working on the Ross Island wind farm. So I'm sure that would have been an amazing experience. So welcome, Dave. Thanks, Justine. I'm Dave. Dave Smith, um, I'm really excited about today. So, um, have we got my slides up? Ah, they're quicker, okay, cool. Cool. So um, I'm gonna talk to you today about um, some thinking that TransPower's been doing about New Zealand's uh, electricity needs into the future. Um, I'll just introduce myself. In, in TransPower. So TransPower owns the national grid. We um, operate the national grid and we maintain the national grid. So they're the big honking power lines around New Zealand. Um, we're a state-owned enterprise. We're 100% owned by the New Zealand government and we're a natural monopoly, obviously. There's only one transmission company in, in New Zealand. So we're regulated by both the Electricity Authority and the New Zealand Commerce Commission. Um, myself, uh, I'm the system planning manager, so I, I run a team of engineers that look at uh, the grid, projecting out into the future, seeing where upgrades might be needed to uh, meet the needs of both generators and um, electricity consumers in New Zealand. Uh, they're a wonderful bunch. Prior to that, um, I worked in the UK uh, for SEC, <coughs> so they were an offshore wind farm developer and owner, um, most notably worked on the Greater Gabbard Wind Farm, which was the second biggest offshore wind farm when it was commissioned, um, and notably the first offshore wind farm to use heli access to turbines. And I also worked on the development of Beatrice Wind Farm up in Scotland, uh, which is a deep water site, uh, about 55 metre water. Um, and it's actually quite an interesting site uh, because prior to it being a large, nearly 600 megawatt offshore wind farm, was a demonstrator site. So there was an offshore oil platform in the area and um, they connected two offshore wind turbines to that oil platform um, as a demonstration of, of offshore wind. Um, prior to my time in the UK, prior to my OE, I worked for Meridian Energy as a, in their wind group. Um, so this today sort of combines three of my favorite things, wind power, um, grid planning, and, and Taranaki, my wife's from Taranaki, so we spend a lot of time up here. Um, so I'm excited. So uh, I guess if we're gonna look at the, the future needs, we, we should probably look at recent history, and recent events. Um, it's a good place to start when you're trying to look into the future to consider the past and what's happening at the moment. So here you can see uh, electricity production for the last 40 years in New Zealand. Um, and there's sort of two major trends there. We had pretty consistent growth in electricity production and use uh, up until the mid sort of mid 2000s, and then it's kind of flattened off in that time. And that's due to a sort of slight decrease in industrial sector consumption, but also demand from commercial and residential sectors kind of flattened off. So it's a bit of, a bit of energy efficiency in there. Uh, if we look at New Zealand's current generation mix, so there's <clears throat> a lot of renewables in there already. We've got hydro coming in at about 60%. Um, and hydro is really interesting. We don't have a significant amount of storage in New Zealand. 
we're quite beholden to the rains in both the North and South Islands into those hydro catchments. And that's a risk uh, for the New Zealand electricity system when it doesn't rain and we go dry. And you see that in the spot prices that Bryony put up before. Um, there's been a lot of geothermal development over the last uh, sort of 20 years and, and prior to that. So it's about 17% of our generation mix. Um, we've got wind in there at about 5.1% and then uh, some thermal as well. And thermal plays, still plays a really important role in um, firming up that, that hydro when it, when it doesn't rain. And of course, we can't forget uh, cogen, which is uh, combined heat and, and power from industrial sites. So, okay, I lost my formula. Uh, some sort of significant changes to the electricity mix recently. So um, as some of you will be aware, the aluminium smelter at Bluff uh, announced that it was going to close in August of next year. Um, the government, current government, uh, said it would enter into negotiations with the smelter to try and um, increase the time frame before it closed, so three to five years, that sort of thing. Um, it's really significant. So it's about smelter uses about 13% of New Zealand's electricity uh, energy, and if it goes, it will release a significant amount of essentially renewable energy into the market, uh, although it is way down the bottom of the South Island. So to enable that, Transpower is currently undertaking quite a significant lines upgrade package of works um, called the Clutha Upper, Upper Waitaki Lines Project um, over the next couple of years, which should allow for getting some of that uh, hydro generation out of Southland and and into the market up to HVDC essentially. Um, the other important aspect is we've, we've seen, and this has been mirrored around the world, we've seen a lot of thermal retirements and coal and gas generation coming out of the market. Um, in the past five years, we've had about 570 megawatts uh, leave the upper North Island. Um, to balance that, Transpower has been investing to ensure that the electricity system is stable uh, with those, those uh, thermal retirements. Um, and uh, I guess it's clear that other generators are also considering their options for their thermal plant as well. So COVID, COVID impacts, um, we obviously saw quite a market decrease in electricity use over the kind of lockdown period, but then we've sort of come back to what is a relatively normal um, sort of state of affairs post that. But I guess it remains to be seen what, what COVID will do to the international economy and New Zealand's economy in the sort of medium and long term, and what effects that may have on electricity consumption. Um, and also, the government's uh, recently announced that they're going to look into storage options to try and counter some of that hydro dry air risk. Uh, MB's got a project called the New Zealand Battery, looking at um, pumped hydro and other storage options. So kind of looked at the current and uh, some of the recent past. I guess it's time to start looking into the, the future. So uh, Transpower released um, a thought piece called Whakamana e Tamori Hiko, uh, thinking about electricity use into the future in New Zealand. Um, we were cognizant of the fact that the government and the country has made commitments uh, to decarbonize. And we thought it was time to do some strategic thinking around how could electricity um, meet some of those objectives. Uh, the thought piece there is, is on our website. I would encourage you to have a read if you're interested. Um, it's, um, it's, it's quite an interesting piece of work. Now I've made the mortal sin of including a video in my presentation, so Cross your fingers for me. Let's see if we can make this go. It's a great video. <laughs> Not going to load. Okay, that's all right. 
have to shorten my presentation slightly. Um, but anyway, so Whakamana E, Tamori Hiko, considers a, a future where we're, we're looking to decarbonize um, and we're going to use a lot of electricity to do that. Um, what that requires for that decarbonization is a significant uptake of industrial process heat becoming electrified. So there are industrial processes where uh, industrial users currently use fossil fuels, coal or gas, um, and they'll be looking to electric technologies to supply that, supply that um, heat energy for their processes. So things like um, industrial high temperature heat pumps um, and other technologies like that. And also um, the electrification of transport. So both, both our, our private fleet, but the heavy transport fleet as well. Um, we, we predict a significant uptake in that. Um, all of you will be aware that prices for EVs have been coming down quite significantly, although they're not, um, not a point same price point as a petrol car at the moment. Um, and I think there's also a, a, a case for some steady underlying growth as well. You'll see in this graph we've, we've included um, the TY exits, that's that 12%, 13% decrease in, in energy use, um, electricity use in New Zealand. So it's a, it's a good news story. Um, reduction in the emissions through electrification, you know, greatly enable our ambition to reach our 2050 targets. Um, we also have modelled a reduction in household energy spending, and the majority of that is by electrifying the household car or both cars, um, so reducing the expenditure on petrol and, and moving to electricity. Um, we will need a lot more generation on the grid to enable this. Um, and a part of this thought piece, we were considering uh, the uptake in new connections of generation and load um, coming at us into the future. And Transpower is preparing itself for the fact that we're expecting a lot more people to be coming through the door um, wanting to connect uh, generation options. <clears throat> so now we've kind of thought about the future, I guess uh, it's important to consider what Transpower's doing, what's our action. Um, I'm helping lead a piece of work called Net Zero Good Pathways. Um, so that's trying to define pathways into the future to help us, help us uh, achieve our electrification ambitions. Uh, the first phase, um, we're looking at um, accessing lower South Island renewables. So that's um, releasing some of those renewables that, that may come into the market as part of the two-way exit. So projects beyond the existing lines work that's currently underway in Southland and Otago. Um, looking at the HVDC link and other line upgrades that we might need to do in the North Island. Um, the second phase, once, once we've completed that, is uh, looking further out into the future and considering what transmission corridors may need enhancement or development into the future of this major growth in demand and major number of new connections uh, eventuates. So that's that's Transpower's view. I would encourage you to um, would encourage you to uh, have a look at. Whakamane Tomori Hiko documents on our website. Um, but we're not the only game in town, uh, as you've noted from the previous presentations. So, um, MB obviously publishes the uh, um, EDGES scenarios, and those are the scenarios that we must use in Transpower for considering grid upgrades um, and justifying grid upgrades to the Commerce Commission. Um, and obviously, Beck has um, has done some work thinking about the future of uh, energy use, but electricity use in New Zealand. So um, they're both excellent reads um, and well worth a look. That's me. Okay. Uh, 
so we have um, got time for a couple of questions for Dave um, on that aspect. Um, so if anyone has a has a question, yeah. Thanks, Dave. Um, in the net zero grid pathways or other frameworks, do you talk about um, strategic grid investment for renewables? You know, the renewable energy zones that Australia is looking at and other countries, and, and if so, how? How do you see that being funded under the regulated model? Yeah, so we are we are cognizant of um, of generation being part of part of our planning. Um, we obviously consider the generation stack that that MB produces. Um, we we'll spent a bit of time looking at the Australian model, AEMO's model, and it is quite interesting. Um, so for, for those that aren't familiar um, in Australia, they look at zones of generation that they could possibly unlock by building transmission into those areas. Um, the, the, the challenging piece, and I don't want to, I don't want to predict the outcome before we've done the work, but the challenging piece in New Zealand is that we have a lot of renewable resource right across the country. And if you look at MB's um, wind report or their solar report, you know, we, we are highly distributed in um, where we have resource. So essentially we're sort of awash with, with renewable options, um, which is kind of quite different, I guess, to the Australian context where they've got pockets of, of renewable options that they're trying to unlock. So that's a challenge for us, I guess, or, or, or maybe it's an opportunity, um, but certainly um, we are modeling generation uh, development into the future and trying to consider what options um, we would need to facilitate with transmission upgrades. Any other questions for Jane? Yep, Jane and Any good guesstimates on how much of that TY energy gets released and comes up north and when and how that might affect our sort of five to 10 year view on generation needs? Yeah, so. I mean, it's a lot. It's a lot of energy. It's 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 five 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 thousand gigawatt hours. Um, and um, to put it really simply, the the Cowlip project, the Clifford Up Waitaki Lines project, releases the vast proportion of that that energy into the market. We, it gets it up to the area uh, where it could be collected by the HPDC and, and taken up to the North Island. Um, but there is still further enhancements that we could do, looking at the HPDC link and the North Island constraints to, to further release that. But the major impact is from, from the Calip works in terms of releasing that. So that those Calip works, um, I'm gonna get the date wrong, but in the next two years, I believe, two to three years, they're gonna be complete. Um, we're looking at HPDC options and North Island options, and they would be some, some further years away. Uh, Daniel Greenwell, Gaskell Wind Energy Association. Um, I just wanted to follow up on that question around the um, net zero grid pathway because, you know, potentially we're looking, I think from what you're talking about, we're looking at transmission investment well ahead of, of generation investment to actually, you know, be able to meet needs. And so, you know, when you look at um, transmission pricing methodology and benefit-based charging and, you know, recent consultations on things like first move at disadvantage, you know, we're looking at potentially a significant investment above current demand to prepare for the future. So what, what is the thinking on that? Because, you know, I know it's clear made the point about, um, you know, Commerce Commission approvals, et cetera. So what's the thinking on how to deal with that? Because I think that's the reality of what we're facing. Yeah, absolutely, Grimble. So I guess uh, the, the second phase of Net Zero Good Pathway is looking at, looking at that, that future. Um, isn't necessarily a classical planning to investment type process. It is really a vision of the future. You know, what would we build if we had perfect foresight and making people aware of those options. We're, we're well aware it takes, takes quite a while to either upgrade or build new transmission assets. Um, but the regulations are what they are, I guess, in terms of, in terms of um, our timing. Um, we, need to, um, we need to meet the investment test as prescribed by the Commerce Commission currently. So yeah, it's always been a challenge for industry green, but I we'll, we'll totally appreciate that building ahead. Well, I think we're, we're in a world now, right? So, what we've been in the past, 
Yeah. Oh, thanks, Dave. Uh, Kevin Rolf, uh, Chemical Engineer, Independent uh, Resource Management Act um, Commissioner. Um, the bringers of Manapuri power up north, uh, how much work is involved in terms of both the power lines and the and the cable across Cook Strait? Yeah, so um, there's more, there's a variety of options and, and we're under investigation at the moment looking at what our great options would be for HVDC. Um, they need to be justifiable, they need to provide a benefit to the New Zealand electricity consumers, um, a net benefit. So the, the benefits to the consumers need to outweigh the costs. So we're working on at the moment at, at trying to discover those benefits and the costs. Um, but yeah, there is a there is a variety of options in terms of in terms of upgrade. One option that's been discussed publicly, I think, um, in the Transpower Transmission Planning Report, is the inclusion of another cable over Cook Strait. So we currently have three cables over Cook Strait, and um, we we would consider a fourth cable and that would bring the HVDC link up to 1,400 megawatts over over 1,200. Yeah, okay. So, um, I mean, Manipuri is grid connected at the moment. It is, it is part of the national grid. It can, can export. Um, it's, not, it's not just connected to Tiwa. That's, that's, that is a very important point. But the capacity of those lines leading out of that area um, are less than, less than desired. So that's the current project. Mm -hmm. Dave, good talk. Um, <clears throat> just one question in from the modelling and from the report, how much are you considering the demand uh, of the major industrial feedstocks that are 100% fossil fuel based now? Are you assuming those industries disappear or are you allowing for the electrification via hydrogen of those industries so we keep them because you can't make molecules out of electrons alone, right? So. Is it what scenario do we lose the industry or do we transition the industry and have we allowed the electricity required to do that? Yes, my understanding and the modeling that it was transition. Um, but I wasn't I wasn't deeply in that in that piece of work. So yeah, that's my understanding of this transition. Cool. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dave. <laughs>
government uh, supporters to get something like uh, a major offshore wind industry underway. Uh, it's not just, it's not going to happen by itself. Uh, at the same time in that role, uh, I was uh, leading the world's largest thermal solar plant that we were developing. Uh, that ultimately was constructed and went into operation in 2014. Uh, we were also developing the world's largest PV plant, uh, which didn't occur at that point in time, but got uh, repackaged a few years later uh, at the same site and, and turned out to be a one gigawatt uh, PV plant. Uh, we were developing uh, the first plant to first solar plant to run 24 hour operation, uh, Hema Solar in Spain, uh, which you can go and Google and, and look at. Um, and for my sins, I was also uh, the lead on a 400 megawatt uh, blue hydrogen project, which was the largest hydrogen project uh, in the world at the time. We didn't get through a uh, final investment decision on that project, uh, basically because of the challenges of putting CO2 into oil wells that weren't quite ready for the CO2. They weren't quite depleted enough, but fundamentally uh, that project uh, flew in all other ways. Uh, interesting, that project, project was uh, done with uh, BP. Uh, my counterpart at BP at the time uh, was Dave Binney, who some of you may know from Zed. Uh, so interestingly, <laughs> where, where people end, end up in the world. Uh, so as you can see, I've quite a, quite a track record in, uh, I guess, uh, renewable mega projects uh, around the globe. And, and uh, why I'm looking a bit tired today is I'm still working uh, in, the, in the Middle East at the moment, and it's two o'clock uh, in my work day. Uh, two o'clock in the morning, that is. Uh, so I'm still half asleep after finishing 2 a.m. last night. So New Zealand Offshore Wind, um, set up by Elemental Group, uh, who as Justine said, I'm a director and principal consultant of. Uh, we set that up around about 18 months ago uh, as I guess the, we'll call it the repository of, of the work we will be, we are doing and are doing in the offshore wind space. Uh, and we specifically set that organization up to partner to, to partner with uh, with people, entities, and stakeholders, as I say, who are you know motivated and capable of trying to drive the offshore wind industry forward. I mean, clearly, and as we'll, we'll talk about today, you know, the first offshore wind farms in New Zealand are still some years off, uh, and there's there needs to be a lot of partnership and cooperation to uh, make that move forward. Uh, one partnership I would mention um, that we that we we're, we're working uh, in at the moment is with a company out of Australia, Energy Estate. Some of you may know them, Simon Curry, uh, who uh, I call the legal grandfather of offshore wind in the UK, uh, involved in uh, almost almost the majority of our projects that that happened in the UK. Uh, very very knowledgeable about offshore wind, and certainly somebody we should encourage to. Uh, I would encourage you to talk to if you're trying to get things moving. Uh, a very very good resource that's available. Uh, we expect to turn some of those um, alliances into, into uh, formal partnerships during 2021. So that's New Zealand offshore wind. So. Um, I want to be a bit provocative today. I want to be a bit thought provoking. Uh, I'm going to try to push the envelope a little bit. Um, so straight out off the bat, I, I don't think there's a lot of point in this forum talking around offshore wind development. Um, fundamentally, and as Dave has almost highlighted already, and I'll, I'll revert, back, revert back to what Dave showed us, there's no market. There's, no, there's nowhere we can put gigawatts of, of wind energy into the New Zealand grid. Um, we, 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 we see, I think, you know, an, a small number of gigawatts needed of, of wind over the next few years, that's, that's not going to come from offshore wind. So what we um, really need to be focusing on, and sort of Andy has already, has already given us the big hint on that, we need to be focusing on what are the businesses, what are the business, in the industrial businesses that, that will, can grow in New Zealand that will actually utilise that resource. So as part of that, let's, um, let's start at the very beginning to quote Julie Andrews. Let's talk about Greta. Now I'm, supposed to, I'm not supposed to like Greta because um, I'm a pale stale male and we're not supposed to like her because she speaks the truth and she does. And I, um, you know, I, don't, I don't know whether she writes her quotes, but they, they, are, they are great. And I think we should all read them and think about them um, while, uh, while Greta's generation may not be uh, completely able to think about them because they're too busy on their phones, I think uh, 
our Makapuna and our, our, our Makapunas, Makapunas will have, have these views and they will look at us and say, did you really need a SUV to drive your laptop to work? Did you really need to go on a ski holiday in Banff? I mean, and we don't, right? And, and you know, Greta's calling uh, the main generation in this room, and unfortunately there's a lot of pale, stale males like myself in this room, um, she's, she's calling us out, and, and we, need, we need to be aware of that. Uh, yeah, I, I, I like this, you know, the, the climate crisis has already been solved, we have the facts, we have the solution, all we have to do is wake up and change. Very relevant to today's forum, uh, and I love this one, which is speaking to her own generation that you can't solve the climate crisis uh, by liking on, on Facebook. We've got to actually do something. Um, didn't have a, uh, a title for this next slide, so I just continued with the same Julie Andrews theme. Um, but this is just the title page from you know, yet another McKinsey report. They've been writing the same report for probably 25 years now with the same key topic areas, uh, you know, about to solving, solving global emissions and how do we do it. Um, all fairly obvious. Um, Reforming food and forestry, electrifying our lives, ad adapting industrial operations, Andy, <laughs> decarbonizing power and fuel, again, Andy, <laughs> ramping up carbon capture and sequestration, something we also probably need to think about um, as a nation as well as globally. And, and those themes really have, have not changed. I mean, I, the report they wrote, um, I, I think I, I first looked at one in uh, early 2000s, had pretty much the same, same themes in it, in it and uh, you know, really not a lot has changed. The, the, same, the same key things are what we need to be doing to solve climate change. So uh, jumping on to uh, the, you know, one of the slides that Dave just presented, um, you know, looking at uh, you know, the, the, the New Zealand power sector out to 2050, and we have this chunk uh, here, here, yep, uh, which I think is six, six gigawatts of wind required by 2050. That's another five gigawatts, less than 200 megawatts a year. That's uh, sufficient wind to keep Grenville employed, but not a lot more, right? 200 megawatts a year. You, that's not. Go, that's not. Uh, of any use to start an offshore wind industry. Yes, you could, within that six gigawatts, you could do a one gigawatt offshore wind farm, but that's not starting an offshore wind industry. It'll, it'll likely be extremely expensive, uh, overpriced, and potentially a, a white elephant sitting there, sitting there as a sole asset. So uh, we're not gonna kickstart offshore wind on a business as usual case. So we, we need obviously a lot more demand for, a, for an offshore, wind industry to start. So let's take a look at you know, where some of that demand may come from. Uh, so this is um, electricity generation in advanced co economies over the years. And you know, while we are seeing quite a reduction in uh, the use of fossil fuels, still 50% you know, of electricity around the world is generated from fossil fuels. And that's a crime, and it needs to be fixed tomorrow. And there only is really only one solution to, to that, and that is that is green fuels. That is that is hydrogen. So, you know, that that's a market, and that's that's a market that if New Zealand chooses to uh, supply into, it, it, it can do. But we have to have a vision that we want to do that. Um, you know, for for New Zealand, that's probably, you know, to, to supply the, in, into that market, it's probably liquid hydrogen, it's probably uh, ammonia, you know, those, you know, exporting those uh, from New Zealand is, is or, or anywhere in the world is, is, you know, still quite a few years away. It's not, that's certainly not happening now. Uh, it's not, it's probably 15 to 20 years out uh, before you'd see significant, um, significant volumes uh, of uh, hydrogen-based fuels being traded. Uh, so again, that's not going to kickstart the, uh, the wind industry out of out of this forum here today. It's it's still quite a long way away. So what what else might happen sooner? So looking 
internationally, what industries use energy? And no real surprises. Basic chemicals, let's call it methanol and urea. Funnily enough, we've already got those industries here. Food, well, no, we obviously have that here. Uh, iron and steel, well, we've got a, a, a part of the industry that's in serious decline, um, but we, we have the capability and technology here. Uh, Non-ferrous metals, well, guess what that is? Uh, that's aluminium, but funnily enough, as a country, we're, we're all talking about shutting down the smelter. Complete mad idea, right? What, 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 what is the world going to need? What's the world screaming out for? Green aluminium. How much, how much carbon footprint is there in a, in a typical ton of aluminium? 16 to 20 tons of carbon. At 100 bucks a ton, $1,600, $2,000 a ton. That's more than the value of the aluminium. Green aluminium, two tons of, of, of CO2 emissions per ton of aluminium, 200, an extra 200 bucks a ton, completely workable. So what's the solution for TY? It's obviously to expand, right? That's what the world needs. That's what Greta's demanding. But no, we're talking about shutting it down and what we're gonna do with the energy, crazy. Uh, what else do we have there? Uh, Non-metallic non minerals, probably we'll call that um, cement paper. We, we obviously have that here and we have a, a closing refinery. Uh, but as you can see, well, and, and, and there's probably one key thing that's because it's not considered an industry uh, that's that's pro probably should be on that list, which is data centers, which is a massive growth uh, and, and requires, you know, very large amounts of low cost energy. Um, all of which, uh, as a country, we could choose to grow, industrialize more and grow and produce those products using our green energy to support the support the globe. Or we can put our heads in the sand and shut down TY and try to move the power north to Auckland. So, I mean, all this is obviously 10 minutes of Google research by an idiot like me, right? It doesn't, it's not, not rocket science. Uh, but let's um, take a look at what uh, maybe some other countries are thinking about. Here's Boris. Uh, and Boris says the UK can be the Saudi Arabia of wind power. So I pose the question, can Aotearoa be the Qatar of wind power? Why do I say Qatar? Uh, if, you, if you know anything about Qatar's growth, uh, it's mainly been off of gas. It's, it happened, it's happened in reasonably recent times. So probably a, a late starter, but a fast follower. Uh, very, very technology-based development of that gas. Uh, they um, used it to develop clean, clean fuels, what were considered clean fuels at the time, such as um, the gas to liquids plant uh, producing clean diesel, uh, LNG uh, replacing you know, with, well, the bridge to the 21st century, as it was called, LNG replacing coal uh, and reduce, re reducing emissions. So, you know, there's an, a nice analogy that... Uh, New Zealand could try to be the Qatar of wind power. Uh, I say, let's try not to be Venezuela. Um, I guess we should be a bit careful about how far we extend analogies about left-wing um, dictatorships. But um, the, um, you know, well, the reason I say Venezuela, largest oil resources in the world, epic fail on delivering them, and now they've missed the boat. Right, and they're in a complete mess. Uh, they'll, they'll, ne they'll never get those, that, 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 that oil will stay in the ground. So let's not be that of the, of the wind sector. Just a quick graphic, just looking at, uh, you know, the EEZ. Oh, I think I've kind of got things to scale there, of the UK versus New Zealand. Um, the, the fundamental point in, in, in the offshore short, short space, we have unlimited uh, wind resource and there's, there's, uh, our wind resource is as good as the UK. Uh, we just need uh, a vision and somebody to try, to try to start build, some of some people, all of us to start bulldozing that kind of thinking uh, into the New Zealand economy such that we start to create the demand that will actually naturally lead to, to offshore wind because it's the only place you're gonna get those quantities of energy. Um, 
That's not to say onshore wind uh, won't be important. In fact, I think onshore wind is the path forward to, on, to offshore wind. I think you know, if, we, if we're going to start, if, if we, for example, we're going to keep the smelter, we're going to grow the smelter, we're going to produce more green aluminium, the logical solution is those expanding those South Island renewables, South Island onshore wind, growing the smelter, tapping Andy's hydrogen plant in there, making, making uh, TY Point uh, a hub of uh, green energy-based uh, uh, industries uh, and, and not even dreaming about moving that power to the North Island. You know, what's it going to cost to get it up there? Um, by the time we get those transmission lines built and, and, and pay for it, it's several billion dollars uh, wasted when the energy could be used right where it is. Um, so, can offshore wind be cheap enough? Um, you know, again, two minutes of Google research. Two plus two. Um, what is the what is the current cost of onshore wind? It's it's internationally it's two cents a kilowatt hour. Um, absolutely no reason why it can't be two cents a kilowatt hour in New Zealand. All the equipment's the same. There's, no, there's nothing nothing particularly unique about New Zealand wind and and Saudi wind. In fact, Saudi's probably not the greatest place for wind, but they uh, you know wind at two cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, and we're already seeing in the UK that onshore and offshore are, are, are delivering power at a similar price. Put two and two together, that's offshore wind in New Zealand at two cents kilowatt hour. That's what we should be targeting. That's what we should be dreaming about. That will enable um, large scale industrial growth using green electricity. And probably we're not going to see uh, the the New Zealand um, gen tailors pursue that. It's not, it's not in their interest, right? They, that's not, not their game. Their game is swapping a few customers, making big profits and keeping their 50% shareholder happy. Um, so I don't think we should be, I mean, they will, jump on, they will jump on the bandwagon, but I don't see that they will be driving that. Uh, they, what, what we need to do is, is create the, get, get the demand stimulated and then they will jump in. But there's no shortage of, um, and we speak to, to plenty of them, there's no shortage of international uh, IPPs who are more than willing to come to New Zealand when, uh, and, I, and I don't know, Jarek, maybe you speak a little bit about that uh, later, but you know, they're, waiting, they're waiting to see demand, they're waiting to see uh, a government vision and they will arrive. And they will arrive quite early. They're not, waiting, they're not necessarily waiting for, for projects to be available to bid on. Uh, they will arrive uh, as soon as there's some pathway uh, for offshore wind to hit the market. Um, just a fun fact, uh, this tariff here, Saudi Arabia, the, the, the person who, uh, one of the key people who worked with the uh, Saudi government developing that project sits working in Eastland Group in New Zealand. Um, so, you know, so we, we, we have, um, we, we, you know, we'll, we'll see it today and we, uh, there's, there's lots of capability and talent already in the country. We don't need to be uh, looking overseas. We just need to herd that and get it moving in the right direction. Okay, uh, the Australia problem. Solar is so much cheaper than wind, so what, we we can't we can't compete. You know, same same uh, story. Uh, solar in Saudi is one cent per kilowatt hour, whereas wind is two cent per kilowatt hour. Now, Andy, um, I'm offering to sell you electricity to make hydrogen. Um, I can offer you the solar here. For the blue is the solar profile. I can offer you that at one cent per kilowatt hour, or I can offer you the wind here at two cents kilowatt hour. Which, 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 which are you going to buy? I mean, don't even need hmm? both. All right, okay, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's true. You'll buy both, but he's certainly not. Got, he's certainly not going to start his hydrogen facility on solar. And funnily enough, he hasn't. Right? I wonder why. Even though everybody's saying it's so much cheaper. I mean, there's no way. Um, you know, if Australia builds out massive solar, that they can then plug that into industrial um, industrial facilities. Uh, the, only, the, the only real renewable technology that can do that is, is wind. And okay, I, I've been a little bit selective in, in, my, in my wind data versus my solar data. I mean, there are obviously days when you don't you don't get sorry you, you don't get um, you don't get wind like that uh, every day. Uh, but certainly, it, it's much more handleable by an industrial facility than this diurnal pattern and worse than the diurnal pattern, the, you know, the sudden drops during cloud cover, et cetera. Um, 
I mean, I'd also point out that, you know, offshore Australia, if you've done anything on Australia and seen what happens when things go offshore and you have to start dealing with ports, costs go through the roof. Look at the, look at the, uh, look at the uh, coal seam gas LNG projects and look at, you know, where costs ballooned on those. Um, I'm, I'm not necessarily sure that Australia is going to be able to deliver offshore wind uh, into industrial facilities cheaper than we can. Uh, so I, I mean, that's kind of where I'm going to end. Um, I think I've used the same slides as everybody else. Um, I'm hope I've given you a little bit of food for thought there uh, that you, we can use for the rest of the day. Um, and you can see that there is, you know, a huge opportunity for Aotearoa uh, if we uh, build a, build a vision. It's going to be, and it needs to be a vision that's that's jointly built by all stakeholders. And we need to be heading in that direction. Um, it, it's going to need a lot more forums like this. It's going to need uh, s some, uh, I guess, uh, direction from government, and and we'll we'll hear from the minister later today. And I, I you know, it, it's quite clear with Araaki being set up here that there's some thinking uh, along those lines starting to happen. Um, certainly, a lot more needs to happen, and uh, you know, I, I guess we need successive governments to get behind uh, what is more of an industrial industrialization plan uh, than a. Uh, you know, a, a greening of, of our power sector plan. Uh, I've just got, I actually just have one other quick slide, but I'm going to flick onto it quickly because I, 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 it's, it's sort of some pr proprietary work that we have been doing um, and I don't want to leave it up on screen too long, but um, we're, we're obviously uh, doing some planning, mapping out of stakeholders and, lo and looking, you know, at how st stakeholders overlap and, and inter interact, interact and uh, you know, that's what we're actively working on for the Taranaki region. We're, we're going to expand that out uh, uh, over the rest of the country. Happy to talk to anybody who wants to talk to us about that. So, um, yeah, there's a huge opportunity for our, for our own Gretas. Thank you. Do have time for a couple of questions for Andrew, um, if anyone's got any. Yeah, uh, Craig Wadsworth, um, to declare my biases, I used to work for Tasman at one stage in Transpower before. Uh, I just spent 10 years living in Quebec and working with uh, some of the oil majors in various parts of the world. I love your idea of industrialization. I just don't know that it's realistic. Um, when I've worked in companies who are sitting there and talking about closing down, when you talk about Rio Tinto, um, as a domestic customer in Quebec, I was paying six cents a kilowatt hour for my electricity. So I hate to think what a how little a um, industrial customer is paying over there. And also working with the oil companies who took from 43 this particular company, 43 refineries down to 12, and is trying to get to even less. And all of those are way bigger than Mars. And how do we push an industrialization strategy when we're up against global companies who've got portfolio approaches and we don't have a scale to be able to manage? Those global companies will come here, right? Uh, they, 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 in a carbon constrained world, they cannot operate uh, the way they have done. And if we have, if we have the green energy opportunity for them, they will come here. Um, I, you know, there are reasons why Rio have been, I guess, bailing on New Zealand for years. That, you know, there's a whole lot of politics and history to the, to the Rio situation. But the fundamental issue is, I mean, in my uh, Middle East job, you know, I'm I'm talking to a smelter, and they're desperate to get green energy. They they you know the world uh, the aluminium sector sees the writing on the wall, uh, and we have the opportunity to to help that sector to 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 grow. And, and aluminium is a great product, right? Um, so, but even to that again, you know, Rio's got far far greater capacity in Quebec, which is 95% hydro. Yep. So it's already got the green capacity. It's got an easier ability to expand. It's closer to its markets. I mean, right, I, but yeah. Saudi's not the only country that produces oil, right? And it produces it at two dollars a barrel, and, and people produce it at forty dollars a barrel. And oil production happens all over the world. So just because one place is cheaper doesn't mean it can meet the, the entire world supply at that price. Kevin, I don't want your question. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. We'll just wait. We'll just um, wait for the mic, Kevin. If it's all right. It'll be a curveball one, I know. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. I'm not asking you the question I asked you over coffee. Good. Um, I was born and bred in Liverpool, so I 
really do um, agree with you regarding the TY point situa situation. There is another alternative, and that's silica. We have silica deposits down there. Silicon is a very, very useful product. We have the raw materials, unlike the bauxite, which comes to TY from Waipa in Queensland. Have you given any thought to that? Look, I guess my, my general view is, you know, if we have and, and, and uh, have a path to delivering two cent per kilowatt, uh, kilowatt hour energy, those industries that, that need, that, that have energy as a key component in their manufacture will come, right? It, it's, that, that's, that, that's logical. So if, if, if silica is one of those industries, it will be there, we, but, but we, we, we need to have a, a vision and a way to uh, delivering energy at, at those kind of prices. I mean, I think Fonterra is a classic. I mean, look at the look at the the coal, the, the massive build out over twenty years in the South Island, all based on coal. And now the protesters are lying in front of the coal train. What what a disaster, right? <laughs> it's a, we we can see China leveraging that to the max, and we really have to help Fonterra out. And, and I'm glad they've got some new leadership with some with that kind of vision. Um, you know, otherwise they're they're in, they're in a disaster state. On um, that positive note, thanks, Andrew. <laughs> oh, apologies. We've got one online question. Sorry, Andrew. I'll get you. You will need a mic, right? Yeah, read the question out. Thanks. And it's more of a comment, Andrew. Um, Great messages, Andrew. Completely agree that the offshore wind without big strategy won't really help New Zealand and New Zealand's globally relevant wind resource demands to be used for the benefit of, benefit of Aotearoa and the planet. Thank you, Bruce Valpley, BPG Associates, listening to and from the late evening in the UK. Oh, fantastic. Great. Thanks so much for that, Bruce. Um, so I'd now like to um, welcome Dave Smith back up. Um, and so this time, Dave is going to talk um, about the grid and special considerations for connecting in New Zealand in terms of um, the grid and offshore wind. So welcome back, Dave. It's a tough act to follow, to be frank, but um, I'll do my best. I've got the, <clears throat> the golden slot, the one just before lunch, so I'll, uh, I'll try and work through it. Um, so I use this as a bit of a sort of thought experiment if we had a, a, de a developer ready to go, wondering how they're going to connect into the, the national grid in New Zealand, what, what that process would be. Um, so um, I'm still excited, by the way. Anyway, um, so just a bit of an overview of the grid uh, in New Zealand. We've got a, a large high voltage AC transmission network. Um, that consists of 220 kV lines, which are the big grunty ones, and some smaller uh, legacy 110 kV lines, which are still very useful. Um, the interesting thing about New Zealand compared to some other jurisdictions is that we have a, a, a quite a massive HVDC link between the South Island and the North Island. So that, that starts at Bimore down, down south, um, and sort of gets, uh, works its way up across Crook Strait and lands uh, in Haywards, kind of near Wellington. Uh, New Zealand's transmission network is, is kind of narrow and, and long. It's the shape of our country, so that helps. Um, load centres are typically distant from gener areas of generation, and that's kind of that renewable energy mix coming into play. You build, build your power plants where the, where the resources are, load centers are where they are. Um, because of our um, generation mix and, and the DC um, system frequency um, is, is quite challenging in, in New Zealand. Um, so it'd be quite different to say continental Europe. Um, for example, the South Island um, can get down to 45 Hertz in very, very extreme events um, and, and um, generators that need to be able to ride through that. Um, we are substantially a, a winter peaking grid. So that's everyone running their heat pumps um, and things like that during the, during the winter. And um, maybe 
it's obvious, but we don't have any interconnection to our neighbors. So there's no power line to Australia or anything like that. Um, I must apologize for the formatting of these slides, but um, quite clear on my screen. Um, so New Zealand electricity market. So, so the electricity um, market essentially dispatches what generation um, should, should, should run at a certain time. So security constrained economic dispatch model. Uh, so optimized for both energy and uh, other services. Runs 30 minute trading periods. People bid into those and um, essentially um, once the load is considered, then the price is set post that. Um, if you were considering connecting a large uh, uh, generator into the market, it's, it's really important that you undertake market studies with um, suitably qualified people to understand how you would operate in the market and what your place is in the market. Um, and it's also important to note that there are other services that you could bid for to achieve uh, other revenue like uh, Black Star, solar services, frequency keeping, things like that. We have uh, um, a wonderful, capable uh, connections team ready to help um, and they're ready to discuss and introduce the experts in, in TransPower sort of no, no matter what stage of your development uh, you're at. Um, it's good to talk to us early and, and, and think through how, how connection might work and we can be really considerate of, of um, of the commercial aspects of your projects and considerate of disclosure. Um, the TransPower website has been updated uh, recently. Uh, there's quite a nice section in there about um, connecting generation in New Zealand. There's a lot of information on there. I would encourage you to, um, to have a look if you were um, seriously considering um, a project or two. So just a really high level uh, view of, of our process. Um, so thinking about a transmission connection, um, a customer would work together with us on a concept how that transmission connection would work. Um, so it'd be initial discussions discussing what's, what's feasible, what timeframes were possible, um, what some indicative costs would be. Um, if things progressed, you'd move into an investigation, so you'd have a dedicated um, respective project team um, in TransPower. They'd be looking at the engineering aspects, um, the property aspects, environmental aspects in terms of consenting to the connection, um, refining prices, refining timelines, um, and that sort of thing. Um, then move to uh, approval. Um, so essentially that would be a capital contract signed with, with TransPower to, to enable that connection. And then um, we'd move into a design and construction type process. So I guess the uh, important thing to consider here is that sort of concept phase. So um, there can be great efficiencies by talking early um, before a project is deeply underway. So I guess uh, special considerations about New Zealand compared to other overseas jurisdictions. Uh, the national grid is, is really open access for generation low connections. So um, um, you connected parties typically cover the cost of connection assets for their connection. So the assets that are required for their connection um, are, are, are costs to them. So we're, we're, we're a relatively small system, um, both in terms of, in terms of our, our load and, and generation. So we do, and being an island, we do have um, quite strong system events when, when they do happen compared to the likes of overseas. So generators need to be able to um, manage that. Um, the electricity participation code written by our friends at the Electricity Authority um, sort of governs what rules and regulations the generator um, <clears throat> so requirements a generator needs to achieve when it's connected to the grid. So that's riding through frequency events and voltage events. So I'll just talk quickly about um, the existing grid infrastructure in Taranaki, give you guys a bit of an overview of um, what we've got here. So the peak load in Taranaki is about 200 megawatts. Um, there is 
uh, about a thousand megawatts of generation in the region. Um, there's both 110 kV network at the national grid and 220 backbone grid in Taranaki. Um, so Taranaki can be an exporter of generation um, and it plays an important role in provision of gas, wind and hydro generation and getting that onto the <coughs> national grid. Um, when I say grid backbone, oh, this can work. Oh, well, uh, so from, from Haywards here, essentially it's these major yellow lines running up all the way up to Auckland and we, we offshoot off to Taranaki. Yeah. So thinking about uh, connection into the grid for a, say an offshore wind farm in Taranaki, it's probably um, only realistic to connect into the 220 kV grid. It's the only one's capacity, I guess, to accept quite a large, large site. Um, we'd have to uh, balance, I guess, uh, connection, um, possibly across multiple circuits to, to, to get it on. Um, and we'd also have to be quite considerate of, of uh, voltage, how the generation site manages voltage. So uh, future development, I guess, in, in, in terms of the grid in Taranaki, um, the Brunswick Stratford lines are, uh, the conductors on some of those lines is, is reaching end of life. So we're considering the future for those lines whether to um, what upgrade options would be available for them. And there's also um, some minor increase in capacity that we could um, do on the Huntley Stratford lines, the lines from Stratford up to up to Huntley with a relatively minor investment. Um, generation export from the region um, is, is always limited um, under extreme conditions and, and very high HVDC south flows. That's a lot of generation coming, coming out of Taranaki and from the north, um, we see the Brunswick Stratford lines um, finding as a constraint and if a very high uh, HVDC north flow um, we see the Huntley Strip lines um, finding it was a constraint. But uh, anything is possible. Uh, local consumption could be increased with the likes of hydrogen, um, process heat, like dairy plant sort of conversion, data centers and things like that. And I think it's really important to note that the grid is not static. It can always be upgraded um, where it's economic to do so um, for new connections. Cool, thank you. Thanks again, Dave. We do have um, time for again a couple of questions for Dave. If anyone has question, thanks, Giacomo Caleffi, ISC Consulting Engineers. Um, could you comment on the resilience of the grid across Cook Strait, that sort of bottleneck between North and South Island? Because obviously one of the advantages for an offshore wind farm Taranaki would be large generation up north. Is that something that uh, gets discussed much, much also because of the Alpine fault, I guess? Yeah, so resilience is a, is a really important consideration in, in, in TransPower's work. Um, there is an investigation underway and in looking at nature with link, not just for a possible upgrade, um, but also for, um, uh, resilience factors of that grid. Um, so yeah, they, they are definitely seriously considered. Um, resilience of the remaining grid is an important consideration in terms of uh, reliability and security as well. So that factors into our investment decision making, absolutely. So over, over here and then, and then Andrew. Oh. oh, he's got a mic already, so yeah. <laughs> yes, it's uh, Colin Thomas here from Warby. Um, I think in your first set of slides you mentioned that TY was 500 um, gigawatts uh, per year, which is basically 570 megawatts. Uh, if you work at divided 5,000. Yeah. So I used to it's 5,000, but if you work it into like an hour, it's like uh, 570. That's correct. Year. Yeah. Quite soon. Um, as we were saying, and uh, we're here talking about wind in Taranaki, uh, and obviously we'd have to get the power to Stratford, but where it becomes, it right. becomes your problem. Um, <laughs> It's a good problem to have. Yeah. <laughs> what's um, what's needed to change the grid in such a way if we, because I think the first, uh, the ministers, or this person, the MBs, a gigawatt was um, 
you know, feasible and economic. So if we dumped a gigawatt into your Stratford system, what does that do to you? Yeah, that's interesting. So it depends on how it would mix with the other generators in the region. You know, would those would those thermals be operating at the same time as a wind farm would be at full output? So that, that's important consideration. You've got a thousand megawatts existing, you had a thousand megawatt wind farm, would you actually have 2,000 megawatts wanting to get out? That's probably quite unlikely. Um, so existing export capacity of the grid under certain conditions about 600 megawatts, slightly more. Um, if there was a very large generation proposal, we would have to consider about upgrading our lines um, to, to meet, the, meet the requirements of that if it was economic to do so. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Transmar obviously has quite some experience in um, subsea uh, transmission, uh, both, um, I guess mainly DC, but I possibly also AC. Obviously, that's uh, important capability and, and knowledge for, for the offshore wind sector. Are you strategically looking at that and using, utilizing that experience not only in New Zealand but internationally? Yeah, so we do have um, some subsea cable gurus in our business, obviously, working after the HVDC link. Um, and I guess maybe for context for everyone, so a, a, a typical offshore wind farm, you'll have an array of turbines. They would be cabled to a collector station, which is an offshore, offshore substation, essentially. It kind of looks like, a, looks like a oil rig, I guess, to those that are uneducated to these things. Um, that would convert voltage up to a transmission voltage, and then you'd bring cabling onto, onto the shore. Um, and that's, once it hits shore, you'd, you'd choose to either remain um, underground to get to the national grid, or you'd, you'd go above ground and build, build um, a transmission line to get to the national grid. Um, back to your question, sorry, Andrew. Um, are, we, are we considering um, subsea um, Transmission, there isn't exactly a strong need for that beyond the HVDC link at the moment, as far as we can see. Um, so, yeah, that wouldn't be the case. Um, uh, no. no. Oh, Andrew, question? Yep. Just, I guess, a follow on question to Andrew's, I guess. Is there a vision we were listening this morning to MB uh, and the question from Jamie, what could New Zealand Inc. do to unlock some of the vision that Andrew just described, to unlock us more than just being a, a country that sits in our little world and, and creates milk? Um, so, milk's good. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, milk's good. That can be right. I love milk. Um, that idea of like what the UK has done, where the transmission company, the transmission, the state-owned transmission company has laid the groundwork for tying into that offshore sector to take a strategic view rather than, a, I don't want to repeat Australia with LNG plants where they're literally falling over each other, no strategy, no central government vision. Do you see there is a role for TransPower to actually take some leadership there? Yeah, I think... Um... Well, I think we need to work together as an industry as well. It's not just TransPower um, working on this stuff uh, on our own. Um, part of the Net Zero Good Pathways work, I see as kind of giving some of that vision and challenging, our, challenging ourselves and getting people's views as part of that and, and consulting deeply, I guess, for the industry, trying to figure out, um, you know, what, what are these kind of sensible futures? And once we see those, how, how are we actually going to get there? So. Um, I think there's a lot of work to do, and don't get me wrong, um, but but we we are getting there. Um, yeah, the UK examples is is quite interesting. The sites I worked in, uh, the developer built the connections to onshore, um, but if you look at uh, say Germany, the national grid only there is actually just building out into the sea, and waiting for people to show up um, with mixed mix success. But um, you know th that's quite a different model, I guess, from from how generation connections have happened in New Zealand. Um, in, in, the, in the past. Yeah. All right. Well, um, thanks again, Dave. Um, appreciate your time and, and doing two presentations. It's, it's definitely a, a big ask. So thank you very much, Dave.
Right, we're we're now um, ready to break for lunch, um, and so uh, we the blessing that Nadia did for our kai this morning covers our kai for the day. So, um, yeah, we'll um, be back at one o'clock um, for our next session. Thank you.